Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Blessed Father, grant to me your Holy Spirit that my words would be your words. Grant to your people your Holy Spirit that they would hear your words and be edified by them. In Jesus' name, amen. God helps those who help themselves, right? We've all heard that phrase. Some people think that it comes from the Bible. It doesn't. You know, a major problem with that saying, with that phrase, though, it, is that if we lived as if God only helps those who help themselves, then what use is God, right? If we live as though God only helps those who help themselves, then what we're really saying and doing is that we are helping ourselves and we don't even need God. All we need is to be our own help, to help ourselves. And more often than not, then, God is left out of the equation entirely. And we get a sense of that mentality, that way of living, from our gospel reading today, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus the beggar. Jesus tells us that the rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. This description of the rich man is a description of someone that we might today call filthy rich, right? He's, he's someone that's beyond wealthy, probably somebody who's a, a multi-billionaire, judging by the way he's living. Purple was a color that was generally reserved for royalty because they were the only ones that could afford it. And clothing oneself in fine linen, you can say the same about that. Only royalty really could afford that. Jesus also tells us that he feasted sumptuously every day. And feasting to the Jewish mindset is something that was only done on very, very special occasions. Like high holy days, if a person of great honor came to visit you, or at weddings. So the fact that this man was feasting sumptuously every day tells you that he was just throwing money around as if it didn't matter. That he's, he's kind of out of control. He's living only for himself and living as if the axiom, the maxim is true that God helps those who help themselves. Now if you'll remember our reading from last week, this comes on the heels, this, this parable today, comes on the heels of Luke calling the Pharisees lovers of money. And that's not just a throwaway line in Luke, in the book of Luke. Today we look at the Pharisees much differently than they did 2,000 years ago when, when Jesus was walking the earth. Back then in those times, the Pharisees were, were people of respect. They were people of renown. They were the sort of people that if you had a daughter, you wanted your daughter to marry the Pharisee. They were the ones in control. They had money. And all of this that they had, the control, the power, the money, all of that was seen as something, uh, seen as a sign of God's favor. How did you know that God was on your side? He prospered you. You were healthy, you were wealthy, you could afford to just throw money around. In fact, Pharisees made it a point to make sure that people knew they had money and that they had power just so that everyone else knew that they, the Pharisees, had God's favor. Now, I'd love to say that this teaching died out with the Pharisees 2,000 years ago, but it didn't. It's alive and well today, and we call this teaching the prosperity gospel. A lot of the most popular pastors in America today fall into the category of prosperity preachers, and among them are, are people like Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, and Joel Osteen. I've actually pulled a clip from one of Joel Osteen's sermons to, to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Uh, this sermon is probably close to about 10 years old, but since in the last 10 years, uh, from what I've seen, heard, what I've read, Joel Osteen's theology hasn't changed very much in those 10 years. Now, I'm not doing this to cast aspersions on Joel Osteen. I'm not saying that Joel Osteen is not a Christian. I believe that Joel Osteen is a Christian. I'm saying this, I'm, I'm showing you this to point out the fact that he gets this particular teaching wrong. And I want you to hear it from his own mouth so that I can uh, then tell you what's, what the problem with it is. So as we play this clip, I want you to pay attention to the characteristics that Mr. Osteen says Christians should have. If you're going to be free, you need to know who you are. You're not just anybody. You're a child of the Most High God. 
He has breathed his very life into you. You have his royal blood flowing through your veins. It's the blood of a champion. You're not ordinary. You come from great stock. Your heavenly father spoke the worlds into existence. And long before you ever got here, he was thinking about you. And let me assure you, he didn't create you to be average. He didn't create you to barely get by, to have all kinds of things holding you back. You've got to get the right vision. God created you to be totally free, to have peace in your mind, to walk in divine health, to have good relationships, to have plenty to pay your bills. God created us as victors and not victims. Yeah. I'll admit, I like it. I like listening to Joel Osteen. He makes me feel pretty good about me, right? He is uh, a very good motivational speaker, right? But that clip right there, that's really all that that clip is. It's a motivational speech. I've listened to uh, some of his other stuff and read some of his stuff. Um, sometimes when he pulls texts out of the Bible and uses them, he is spot on, dead on with his theology. But oftentimes, very often, he turns the Word of God like he did right here into sort of a self-help book, a book that teaches God helps those who help themselves. How do you know that God favors you? Let's look at the characteristics that he laid out for us. You're supposed to have peace of mind, to walk in divine, divine health, to have good relationships, to have plenty to pay your bills, to pay your bills, and you're a victor never a victim. Now, think about your own lives according to these criteria. Right? I'm going to take a risk in just a minute. If you meet these five criteria, you have a mind that's at peace, you have complete good health, you have complete good relationships, uh, you don't have to worry about money, and you've never been a victim. If you meet all of those five criteria, I want you to put your hand in the air right now. Yeah, I didn't think I was taking much of a risk by doing that, right? You see, if you meet all of those criteria, that probably means you're living life like the rich man lived his life, the rich man from our parable today. Dressed in the finest clothes, the biggest house, the nicest car, and feasting sumptuously every day. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have money, if you eat well, that doesn't mean you are a bad person, right? You can have money and still have faith and still be a good person. But these promises that Joel Osteen gives to those, these, these characteristics, uh, a, a mind at peace, divine health, good relationships, not having to worry about money, never a victim. These are promises that we have. These are promises that God gives to us. However, what Joel Osteen does is he confuses the promises of God in Jesus Christ that we will have an eternal life. And he brings those promises of Christ into this life. And then in this clip, he teaches that if you don't have these things now, you're not living your right life. Right? But that's not what Scripture teaches. And our parable today, the rich man and Lazarus, is a story that makes this disparity very evident. When Martin Luther died, in his pocket they found a, a scrap of paper, and on this piece of paper was written a phrase, We are beggars. This is true. Martin Luther was, the, was a man who flaunted the power of the Pope. He dined with princes and kings. Martin Luther changed the world. Martin Luther was a rich man, even if his pocketbook didn't always say that. Yet he recognized that in this life, we are beggars. Even if you have all the wealth in the world, we are beggars. We are like Lazarus, sitting at the gate of God, begging for his mercy, desiring the scraps of food that fall from the Lord's table. But thanks be to God that he gives us so much more than scraps. He gives his people... He gives us his son. Jesus is the rich man who became a beggar. 
He is the rich man who became like Lazarus. He's the rich man who became like you. He set aside his throne, he set aside his dominion, and became completely reliant on his father as a human being, as your brother. He trusted in his father for all things. So why don't we stack the life of Jesus up with Mr. Osteen's characteristics of a Christian. First of all, peace of mind. Luke 22, 42 to 44. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Sounds like some real mental anguish to me. The second characteristic, walking in divine health. Now the scriptures don't mention if Jesus was ever sick, but we certainly know that he suffered. I dare say that being whipped within an inch of your life and then being nailed to the cross is not good for anyone's health. Having good relationships. Did Jesus have good relationships? His family thought he was crazy. His friends deserted him. He was betrayed by Judas. And the people he came to save were the ones shouting, crucify him, crucify him. I think he had some relationship issues too. What about finances? Was Jesus rich? Did he have all the money that he needed? Yeah, he did have all the money that he needed. But he probably could have used more at times because he was born into a poor family worked as a carpenter, wandered from town to town for three years, didn't have a place to lay his head, and the scriptures tell us that sometimes Jesus hungered. He might have had some money issues from time to time. And not a victim. Was Jesus a victim? He was betrayed, falsely accused, falsely convicted, and then executed. Sounds like a victim to me. Even Jesus doesn't pass the test that Mr. Osteen puts forward for what it is to be a Christian. And if Jesus doesn't fit your test, you might want to reevaluate that test. Jesus did not come so that any of us would be healthy and wealthy now. Look at poor Lazarus. Covered in sores, desiring to be fed with the scraps that fell from the rich man's table, and unable to even stop the dogs from licking at his sores. This life was miserable for Lazarus. Miserable. But then the great reversal happens. The great reversal happens through Jesus Christ. In this life, Lazarus was a beggar. But in the next life, he's comforted and receives all good things. The reversal also happens for the rich man who put his trust in himself and in his own things. In this life, he was rich. In the next life, he now becomes the beggar. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and put a drop of it on my tongue, for I am in anguish in these flames. Help me, Father Abraham. We are all beggars, either now in this life or in the life to come. Now, everyone here has experienced some of the problems that Joel Osteen lays out for us that we shouldn't be experiencing. Mental anguish, poor health, bad relationships, money problems, being a victim. You, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are in good company. Lazarus experienced all of those things. Your Lord Jesus Christ experienced all of those things. The servant is not above the master. Jesus promises that in this life, there will be trials and problems, mental anguish, bad relationships, what have you. But what Jesus did for Lazarus, he also does for you. He makes beggars rich. He brings you to his table and gives you far more than just the scraps. There will come a day when you have complete peace of mind, you'll be completely healthy, you will have great relationships, money will not be a problem, and you will be victorious sitting alongside your Lord Jesus Christ. 
That day is not today. Until that day comes, your Lord Jesus Christ invites you beggars to his table to feed on the bread that comes down from heaven, to put off the robes that have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb, and to trust that though things aren't perfect now, one day they will be. In Jesus' name, amen.